So uh, let's get started. Um, the talk is uh, state channel architecture and protocols. Um, this is just <clears throat> up front. This is not a state channel 101. This is really more in the advanced level to you know reason about why cellular network decides on this kind of architecture and what on the more like a lower level the protocols. How that, uh, does the protocol work? And you know, cellular network starts as uh, with a simple mission. We want to scale all blockchains. You know, yes, apparently Ethereum is one of the most active ones, uh, but we do support uh, different kind of uh, public blockchains. Um, the the idea here is that we try to adopt a layered architecture. So when we want to say work with another blockchain, the only thing that's different is you know the adapt. You can think about the adapter layer that runs a smart contract on a different blockchain, and you know. The technology uh, path we have chosen is layer two state channel. Um, the benefit is pretty obvious, right? With state channel compared to sidechain or all the other uh, different you know, scaling solutions, it has many benefits like instant finality and also the throughput is, can be you know, linearly scale out instead of you have to beef up the, the network or you are limited by how many say, block proposers you can get. Because in state channel, there is no block. Basically, the speed can be as fast as the internet. And you know, we have been in production for a few months and with actually pretty, I would say, in terms of the within the blockchain community, pretty amazing numbers. Yeah, like for the monthly active user, for the transactions we have carried through with real money, you know, real ETH or DAI or the other tokens on the mainnet. And on the other side, our users coming from 89 countries. I think that's kind of something really you know, hit me as, oh, this is the power of the blockchain. Aside from the users, we are also very actively working on to onboard the like non-blockchain developers onto the blockchain world, especially on the seller platform. So we actually have more than 250 developers already signed up on, the, on our developer portal. Um, <clears throat> more than 100 games submitted. The, the idea is we want to kind of hide or encapsulate all of this complexity, be it interacting with on-chain, be it off-chain, be it, you know, all this complexity within our SDK and we expose very simple, easy to use APIs to developers. So our, our you know, tagline is basically say two lines of code and you're good, you're good to go. You can run your carrier games already on seller platform. Aside from, you know, the gaming vertical, we also provide a more generic, you know, seller web SDK. Just, you know, I think many of the uh, current blockchain developers are more familiar with, you know, uh, web-based front-end development. So using the web SDK, it enables, you know, um, yes, you have to deal with a little bit more detail, like a, low, a little bit more lower la level operations, but then you get the flexibility to say, you are not restricted to only um, having a game, right? You can do many of the, you know, many people talk about the DeFi or whatever, the derivative prediction market, all these kind of fancy, um, all the top uh, hot topics that people are talking about in the community, you can benefit from the layer two solution. Um, in short, it's instant finality, uh, be, meaning you, know, you don't have to wait the moment there the message co-signed by all the participants, it's finalized. And the other part is there is literally no transaction fee, right? There is nothing about that. Um, in past uh, hackathons, like in East San Francisco and East Boston, there are projects actually building very interesting streaming payments. And basically, said because the payment today is so low cost, so instant, you can use that in some some new way that you know prior that no one think is even possible, right? Basically, say uh, literally I'm doing the payment every second and a very tiny amount. You can even pay just a single way, right? No one will ever do that on blockchain because uh, the gas fee will be already so expensive. At the same time, we open source our code, you know, smart contract, everything, and the full product protocol specification, including the motivation and the, the, the kind of the trade-offs we have to make to make the protocol work efficiently. So just to quick summarize, so <clears throat> Seller Network already has uh, the largest scale production network running for a few months with the real user numbers and the real money playing as one of our seller X vertical for eSports mobile games. And uh, in the past you know, one year and a half since seller network, the project started, we have been driven by, by real use cases. Basically, user, real user feedbacks 
be it experience, be it onboarding, be it, you know, it's too slow to interact with Zonchain, all these 10 points, we have internal rapid iteration to solve, basically to, to identify the problem and make a, a, find a good solution for that. At the same time, <clears throat> because there are different other projects very interested in the state channel space as well, we are leading the cross project uh, standardization process. Basically, we say instead of you know everyone reinvent the wheels, let's sit together. We share what we have learned from the process, and you know, get different ideas and see how we can make it more like a common agreed upon spec. Then all the projects can benefit from. Right. The last point is I mentioned earlier. Our developer portal already has more than 250 non-blockchain developers sign up, you know, and then submit their games. Yeah. That's kind of the high-level overview of what you know, Seller Network, the project, the technology underneath, and also the first vertical we pick for mobile esports. Now, you know what, what's coming next will be a little bit, you know, as I mentioned earlier, it will be a little bit advanced. But then, you know, there's nothing like like rocket science. You you need like complicated formula. But then, the design and the thinking behind that, um, I'm hoping, you know. Be it you are even you are not really interested in like a lower level system design, you might get some kind of inspiration. And say, oh, this kind of design philosophy could help. Right. First of all, it's pretty simple. We adopt what we call a layered architecture. If you see, uh, if you uh, many people know, like the internet has been so successful today, uh, in terms of the academia or the industry, many contribute the successful or the like super high scalability to their layered architecture design. Basically, you have the lower layer physical or IP layer, then you have application layer. Each layer <coughs> promise a common, well, upon, uh, a well ag agreed upon interface to upper layers, and they don't even worry about what you, what's the new application you want to write. Imagine the internet, the core of the IP protocol was defined 40 years ago, right? And then at that time, people might say, oh, it could be some other fancy, application that use up to like one kilobytes per second. Right? Now today, if you look at the internet today, we have Netflix, YouTube streaming, real time, even 5G enable like remote uh, medical operation. Right? All this doesn't even change the IP layer. So that's the power of layered architecture. And I think Seller Network kind of uh, being the, the founder's background also coming from the computer networking uh, research, but kind of it comes out as pretty natural say, hey, we want to separate the concern. We identify, oh, there's uh, the bottom is what we call the anchor to the mainnet or to the blockchain. And then on top of that, we have what we call a payment channel. It will be a payment network only takes care of what token you want, you want to exchange within this layer two network. Then on top of that, we say, if you want to write your own say financial uh, prediction market or you just want to write your own um, you know, go or chess game, that's our application. So this is simplified three layers, right? The bottom is the mainnet, the smart contract, and the middle is our payment network, and on top is the applications. Yeah. This gives us kind of the benefit just like the internet. It's, it's simpler in each layer, and it's, at the same time, you can really optimize within each layer, say, hey, I can make it even more efficient by not worrying about too many different use cases. Imagine when they were designing the IP, they have to consider how t like the YouTube works there, right? It, they didn't, so that's why it's so successful, because they, they focus on how can I make IP protocol only solve the single problem is like routing or like reach any other node on the internet, that's it, right? And even for like reliable transportation, it's the transport layer's uh, job. After that, it's HTTP or like Google has done all the other stuff like Quick or anything. So, uh, but at the same time, remember, just like internet, the flexibility is, is much, much greater. Because we define this layer, we say, that's it. Any application, as long as you comply to our interface, which is actually pretty minimal, you can run on top of seller. Yeah. Now let's kind of zoom in and say, what defines a payment channel, right? So what really is the minimal information you need? Just like for IP, you need the source IP address, destination IP address, some header, some sequence number, some checksum, right? For payment channel, we also have to define kind of a data structure. Right? So this is like the core of a seller network's data, a data model. Here, again, this is like uh, after several iterations, this we believe is pretty you know, optimized and, you know, uh, between two peers, instead of 
try to maintain a shared single number, we actually define two one direction, what we call simplex. And in each simplex, the owner of the simplex, basically the sender of the simplex, is free to update its own sequence number and say, hey, this is the new uh, state, this is a new payment, I agree with you, here you go. And what the other, the receiving end need to do is simply co-sign and send it back. <clears throat> this avoids you know, many of the common issues caused by you know, the, 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 the other projects. Say, hey, you need to have two, um, two nodes try to maintain agreement on updating a single number. And oftentimes, that doesn't work because your client may get disconnected, especially if you think about the mobile environment. Say the guy walk out of the, the, the hotel and he disconnect from Wi-Fi, reconnect on you know, 4G or LTE network, then your previous cosine negotiation will just break. Right? So that, that's like um, optimized for really production use case. Anytime the client is, uh, the other peer is reconnected, they can resume the communication and no one needs to really wait or even blocked by the disconnection. Right? And also what we show here is literally, literally our actual data definition written in protocol buff. You know, it's uh, something from Google, it's also open source, well supported. The only actual we add, you can see this so type, right? This is something we contribute to the community in the op as an open source project and also recognized by the official, you know, Google uh, protocol buff project on, on their wiki page to say, oh, <laughs> by default, you know, proto protocol buff support like uh, common languages, JavaScript, C, C++, Java, Python, Go, blah, 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 and all that. But of course, no, no solidity, right? So, but we do need the capability in our smart contract to decode protobuf encoded binary data. And uh, we look around, there were some kind of uh, hobby project. It doesn't up to the quality we expect, so we kind of invest our uh, engineering resources and say, let's make one. And you know, this is a hint to tell uh, the open source um, uh, pro, uh, solidity generator that reads this kind of data structure and uh, automatically generate a decoder in solidity. Right? So I think that's actually uh, on a, a GitHub Seller Network. It's called pb 3 2 so um, That's the uh, pb 3 genso That's the solidity code automatically generator we have done by reading this like data schema definition. And the reason we have to add all these types, this is the solidity native type. Again, we could just use like bytes, but it will incur, incur much higher gas cost. So that's the opti optimization to the minimum, like to the maximum. Like Solidity has native uint64, but the reason we put uint here is to save literally, literally four gas, you know, in unit, in gas unit, four. The reason we have to do this because imagine this data structure will be used really frequently between all these communications, even uh, a saving of four, is worth it. Yeah. So you have mm -hmm. like six keys in it. Mm -hmm. There's a small module for the small module. Where is it like a tool? You would have to have a tool. You don't need the two address. <laughs> so the that channel ID is defined. The channel ID is def you know, yeah. The hierarchical uh, data is, you know, one channel ID defines the two participants. And one simplex only need to define their owner. That's peer from. Yes. That's a good question. Thank you. Yeah, and now we move on again, right? As I mentioned earlier, this is more like a deep dive into the seller core technology. This is how we define a conditional payment. The, the, the reason is, you know, the whole, whole purpose of layer two is to enable uh, frictionless, uh, low latency, zero latency, the, the same latency as internet latency, right? There's no block, there's nothing. There's no agreement or consensus needed. The only consensus that we need is the cosine of the message. And, but then at the same time, remember this layer, just like IP, need to be flexible enough to support upper layer applications. And we cannot predefine that, oh, you can only write the games on top of Seller. So we make it very generic. If you say, this is just defined a payment, right? The, it, for payment, it doesn't have to, because the payment could be multi-hop, we define source and destination. Basically, in that other term, source is the payer. The destination is the payee, right? And then, it can say the pay only happens when the conditions are satisfied. And of course, the condition has different types. And for the pay, we also defined how, how do you, let's say you have a pay, has the condition on tomorrow's temperature and how the, you know, the moon is aligned with the earth. 
And then you say, those two numbers combined together is how much I pay you, right? So that's, that's the complexity we can support. And the flexibility, so basically, we kind of say, we define the, the common basic abstraction, but at the same time, it can enable all kinds of, you know, wild application the developer can think about. Yeah, I think, you know, before that, up until now, we have been very clear about, you know, between two peers, you know, that's, the, that's what we call the hop-by-hop -hop conditional payment primitive. It's just like on the internet, you know, there is a hop-by-hop. -hop. Very similar in cellular network design. Then we say, borrowing again from the internet philosophy, design philosophy, it's an end-to-end argument, we design the multi-hop payment network. Basically, instead of only support between two directly connect peers, you can send your payment um, through like all these relay nodes to reach your actual final destination. And I think this actually gives you the flexibility we are using the same cellular network to support arbitrary, you know, um, C D apps, right? So basically say you can have a chess. You don't want every time the two players want to uh, play uh, one round of the chess game, they need to set up a state channel up front. You don't need to do that. With seller, as long as they both join the seller network, the routing algorithm automatically finds the optimal path and make sure that the two players, just like they have, will feel the same as, as if they have a direct connected uh, channel, but at, at the, in reality, they are actually multi-hop underneath. Right? So basically, today, when you say I'm connecting to Google server, you know there are, it could even be like dozens of routers between you and the first Google server that respond. But you don't see that. You don't even care about that. That's the same idea here. Yeah. So the reason, again, right, to really make it easily scalable, uh, because now we are pushing more of the complexity onto both ends, right? so the, the, the source and destination. And all the nodes as a relay node in the middle, just like an internet router, does very simple uh, relay of the kind of, they receive a conditional payment, say, oh, I'm not a destination. Where is the destination? Using the routing algorithm, find the next hop and send it out. And so that, I think that's significantly minimize and reduce the relay nodes complexity. And that's kind of another reason we can learn from why internet can scale out so easily because you can easily deploy more routers and then the, the clients can join and interconnect the whole network. Yeah. So <clears throat> with multiple hop, now basically we have per hop primitive then we have a multi-hop network. Then we say, what else we can do, right? We, we have to uh, deal with the Boolean condition. That's a little bit like, more like I mentioned earlier. Like say, B and C are the relay nodes. They just need to do the count pay request and response between the next hop, right? And the final resolve of the pay happens between, you can see the dashed line happen between the actual source and destination A and D. Yeah. This, uh, again, right, all of these materials is also on our website with the, you know, more like detailed documentation say, hey, the design is in such a way because we consider all the others, uh, like, for example, security guarantee. For example, oh, you do not want to assume the client can always be online watching something, right? So I think that's all the design choices we have made to, like, lead us to this kind of um, final engineering solution. Yeah, after we have done with Boolean, basically the idea here is that it's, Cellular network has been like designed with uh, very optimized for common case Boolean uh, condition, meaning you either pay or not pay, which already cover, I would say, more than 90% of the cases people can think about, right? In, in, especially in, in real life, you think about a payment, especially a partial payment is actually not very common. Right? If you go to a merchant, they will not say, hey, you, you pay me depends on you know, uh, how many push-ups you can make, right? Basically, it's more like a fixed price is either happen or not happen. So in our um, term, it's called Boolean condition. And because of the flexibility of this multi-hop uh, primitive, we can support numeric. Go back to the ex example earlier. Um, you know, in, in ads, like Google, Facebook, when they try to make money from the advertisers, they actually use something called second price auction, which is a common... Um, you know, um, game theory uh, conclusions that, hey, even you are the highest bidder, let's say uh, you, you are bidding for showing your ads. Or just to keep it simple, let's say you want to bid for the painting in the entrance, right? Um, 
You say, I want to go uh, be, say, a uh, 10 ETH. Um, but if you later you learned the second uh, bidder only uh, bid one ETH, you will feel, oh, I, I paid too much, right? So the common um, reaction would be, it would be great if my actual pay is only a little bit higher than the second bidder, or even the same, right? That actually will encourage every bidder to bid their true price from their heart. So basically, th that's the game theory trick. You can do a lookup, you know, of course, there are the tons of literature research about that. And it's actually, really, that's the money printing mechanism for F Google, Facebook, and all the ads company. The adv advertisers are free to bid much higher price, but in the end, they don't pay that price. They only pay who paid uh, the second, the highest bid price. And that's where the numeric comes in. So basically you say, I'm willing to pay, say, 10 ETH. But in the end, it's, you know, if the second highest bidder is say, only one, you only pay one. So that's a numeric case. And on seller network, we also support that, which is kind of, yes, it will be more complicated than a simple Boolean. But we still try to make sure the interface, right? Just like on, on top of IP, you can have TCP that provides reliable transmission and also UDP that say, I just do whatever I can, right? So, yeah, this kind of is ex right now in, in production on top of the Ethereum mainnet, what we have has been running for a few months and we kind of uh, have been to different hackathons and have developers try, you know, some developers will say, oh, I really like the, the idea of a mobile esports game. I will just do the gaming on CellX. And some say, hey, I'm really into this whole DeFi, you know, prediction, you know, market or like derivative uh, thing. They can do something um, using the web SDK, right? And uh, <coughs> the power of this modular architecture will actually show we are not limited to what we can provide today. The same interface can actually support, if you are into the blockchain uh, space, right? You might heard about some other um, like idea like Nitro, which on the surface looks completely different, but it's one other choice, that kind of uh, proposal for state channel, right? But then when we take a closer look, we say, hey, our uh, underlying primitive actually can make that happen, right? I think uh, another and, and, and <coughs> note is, uh, from the original Nitro proposal, uh, I think they are still having some issue with the multi-hop. And remember, we already solved the multi-hop problem, right? So by in, on top of Seller, we actually, using the underlying hop-by-hop uh, -hop primitive, we can actually make Nitro working multi-hops than the original independent Nitro protocol. So I think that's really show the power of modular layered architecture and design. Yeah, I think that's the... That's the last slide I have. Um, for any question, we have the, you know, we have all this communication channel you can think about, um, and also our uh, documents, and what I actually mentioned in this whole talk is public on our website. Yeah, that's it. Thank you.